I just, uh, I'd like to introduce, my name is Timothy Davis, I'm a researcher here at Glural, and this is a seminar based on the Glural uh, Siler seminar series, so thank you again for, for showing up both in person and uh, those of you who are on the webinar. The speaker today is uh, Dr. Brett Nylon. Uh, Dr. Nylon received his PhD from the University of New South Wales. He, uh, after his PhD, went through two postdocs, one in geobiology at Stanford University and the other uh, where he got into the toxins and the, uh, and, um, the genetics of, of toxin production was uh, in Berlin. Uh, since then, he has been a, a fellow for the Australian Research Council since about 1998 and a research professor at the University of New South Wales. Uh, on the topic of uh, cyanobacterial ecology and the genetics of toxin production, he's uh, accumulated over 200 papers on this uh, topic, so he's uh, one of the world's foremost experts, and I'm uh, glad he could join us today. And uh, um, his talk will be on the genetics of cyanobacterial toxin production. Uh, I would ask that if you have any questions, uh, please hold them till the end, and when you do ask, uh, move to the microphone at the center of the room so that the folks on the webinar can hear. And for those of you tuning in via webinar, if you have a question, uh, feel free to type it into the box, and at the end of the seminar, I will uh, come to the microphone and, and repeat those questions uh, for Dr. Nyland. Okay. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for the invite to come to Ann Arbor. Feel a little sorry for the people joining by webinar <laughs> because uh, Ann Arbor has no accommodation this weekend <laughs> due to the uh, art festival. Lucky people here. <laughs> so thank you for attending locally as well. Yeah, I'd like to talk about, uh, it's, I guess now it's a 20 year history of my research on the biosynthesis of cyanobacterial toxins. and. Uh, just to let you in on a secret, it was quite easy because I had a history, and that sounds smug, but I had a history of studying human genetics and at that time when we think about 25 years ago, PCR was a really a hot new technique and essentially what I did was transfer what I knew in that field of human genetics to the environment and I'm kind of glad I did now because the people working in the field of environmental microbiology are much nicer than the people working in clinical genetics. So uh, cyanobacteria, as you may all well know, is a, a very old group of, bac of bacteria with microfossils dating back three and a half billion years. And uh, we have the stromatolite evidence of two and a half billion years ago, plus the uh, origins of our uh, oxygenic, oxygenated uh, um, atmosphere. They're an incredibly morphologically diverse group of um, bacteria. The interesting thing that I found, this is during my PhD studying phylogeny of cyanobacteria, there's very shallow genetic diversity in that group of bacteria. What you do see, however, is this incredible range of adapted physiologies which have allowed them to uh, habit, uh, inhabit so many different niches on, the, on our planet, well, just about every niche, environmental niche that is. The carbon and nitrogen fixation, the accumulation of phosphates, uh, production of these resting cells, whether they be differentiated into the form of uh, echinates or just um, via dormancy. The buoyancy is a huge issue when, you, when we're talking about bloom, uh, toxic bloom formation. And then, and then as I'll talk about today, these very small bioactive molecules, uh, which has been the topic of my research for 20, 20 years. And I guess one of the interesting points that I want to uh, make you aware of through this talk is that these cyanobacteria, because of this morphological and geographic diversity, have really inhabited so many different niches and that they do become regionally specific, even though they're highly, very highly related in terms of what they can do, they have regional specificities. And so a lot of the work that I've done on this slide here is showing you where we've done a lot of our work in the, as Tim said when I was working at Stanford, a lot of the work was around the uh, stromatolite formations in Western Australia. Fascinating place in the world if you can get there. 
And Tim, when I collaborated with Tim, was up in Brisbane where they had big problems with lingbia and lingbia toxins. And again, most of the work, as I'll show you throughout this uh, seminar, has been the work studying the genetics of cyanobacteria, in, particularly in drinking water supplies, which obviously is where the funding came from originally. You'd be surprised to know that it was a government authority that funded research. And, and, and just as a side note, we're also looking at the, not just the toxin molecules anymore, but because cyanobacteria produce so many of these small bioactive molecules, we've uh, done a fair bit of work in uh, tropical regions, say in the Great Barrier Reef of Australia and Papua New Guinea, but also you know other not so, uh, uh, how would you say, uh, nice places for holidays, <laughs> uh, but say desert crusts and hot springs and polar, so uh, polar soils as well. One good thing about environmental microbiology, as I was saying, as opposed to clinical genetics, is you do get out into the environment and enjoy these parts of the world. So this is, I just want to show you uh, the basic taxonomy of sun bacteria broken down into five orders, uh, where you have these various different morphologies ranging from the filamentous with the heterocyst and nostocales, and you have the same sort of uh, Physio uh, sorry, morphology, again, but with branching of the filaments. You have the filaments without the differentiated cell types of the oscillatoriales. And then you have the unicellular groups of the crucocales and uh, the glia, glia capsales. So you, there's a whole range. One thing holding them all together taxonomically is the fact that they do oxygenic photosynthesis. But uh, more specifically on the blooms, enough of the nice the nice cyanobacteria, but I, yeah, I do want to impress that one of the major reasons why water quality managers in Australia got in, involved in this 20-something years ago is because we only have one source of water in Australia. We don't have, we, we do have groundwater, but it's not potable, so. Um, you see these major blooms happening around the world in the Baltic, for instance, in this sort of brackish water, and, and most recently you've probably all heard of the problems in Taihu in, uh, in uh, eastern China where I think most scientists have visited <laughs> if they've worked in this field. But t China turns out to be an interesting case study because it really was where we got the first evidence of the, the uh, actual disease, that the d diseases that this, these toxins are producing. And that was with a great old mentor of mine. Well, he did all the work. It was um, with Wayne Carmichael studying the, the epidemiology of people drinking surface versus well water in China. And of course, the well water not, not being able to accommodate the growth of photosynthetic organisms, those populations had a much uh, lower incidence of um, liver cancers or liver tumours. And so the uh, molecules I'd like to talk about today, or the biosynthesis of, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on microsystem because it's had the most research performed on that small molecule, um, both in terms of toxicology and chemistry and, and biosynthesis. But I will, um, you know, compare the biosynthesis of microcystin to that of nodular and very similar cyclic peptide structure. And then again, it's kind of like an evolution of the genetics of biosynthesis that, the, that we've led on from the genetics of the, the cyclic peptides to those of the more polyketide or alkaloid, alkaloid structures of cylindrospermopsin and most recently saxitoxin and anatoxin. Anatoxin AS still has not been um, determined in terms of its biosynthesis, just like um, BMAA hasn't had much work done on in terms of biosynthesis. And this is just an example of what happens in the rivers in Sydney. Um, this is just west of, um, in, the, in the western parts of Sydney, it's called the Hawkesbury or the Hawkesbury Nepean River. And I'm looking to buy a block of land. They should they sell quite cheaply actually. But um, this, this river is traditionally used for irrigation, spray irrigation purposes and there have been a fair few studies on the use of this sort of uh, contaminated water for spray irrigation. And also at the, uh, the outlets of this river where there's a lot of oyster farming. And uh, a, an interesting point is when you look at the, um, uh, again going back to that whole human genetics issue, after the human genome was uh, completed, the world said, what are we going to do with all this great machinery? And they said, oh, what about that other group of living things? Oh, what are they? The, yeah, the bacteria. Um, why don't we have a look at sequencing some genomes of those things that might have something to do with the, the running of the planet? Um, 
and that's me being big. Australians are quite sarcastic, by the way. So, <laughs> just thought I'd let you in. Um, when I look serious, that when I look most serious is when I'm actually telling the best joke. So around about here is when the human genome was all completed and then other individuals done, did their own sequences. But then there's this massive rise in the number of, uh, you know, 30,000, put the glasses on, 30,000 bacterial genomes, but there's still only been about 300 cyanobacterial genomes done. And for me, I know it's a bit of a, it's a personal issue, but cyanobacteria to me are just so important in terms of the functioning of the earth. And to have so little of their genomes known is, is to me, a bit absurd. It's, it's, and really, out of those 300, I'd say about 150 of those have been done in the last year. Yeah, and by places like the Pasteur Culture Collection have done a lot of their strains during that time. So the, the breakdown of this seminar is I'll talk about the biosynthesis, uh, which is the, the straight genetics, or the genome of the organisms that... Um, produce these toxins, how, those, how that biosynthesis is regulated at the molecular level and the cellular transport of those toxins, which is a water management issue and plus a fairly interesting scientific issue too. And then the, finally the distribution evolution of these uh, gene clusters that encode the biosynthesis of toxins. And I'll just finish with a, a small example of how we've used this information in a, in a more operational sense for water management, water quality management. So as I said, these, the toxins can be broken down into two categories roughly, the cyclic peptides and the alkaloids. And the cyclic peptides are those, the microcystin nodularin, which typically have uh, an effect on liver. So they're hepatotoxic and they're also tumorigenic. And the alkaloids uh, are more the class of uh, structure that acts, that acts as neurotoxins. And the alkaloids are the cylindrospermopsin, saxitoxins and anatoxins. Or as I like to describe it to the students when I give lectures, is the good drugs and the bad drugs. So the cyclic peptides of, of the class of things like penicillin and the antibiotics we use when we have an infection and the good drugs or, well, if you're, depends if you're a student or a professor, right? <laughs> Good drugs, bad drugs, alkaloids are things like cocaine and heroin. Um, so microcystin is going to be the main example that I'll use through this seminar webinar is because it's had so much information uh, developed on it. It is a, it's a pe cyclic peptide, but it's a non-ribosomal peptide. So as most of the proteins we know are, are translated on the ribosome, these are, these are not made on a ribosome, these are made on a large enzyme complex. The, again, there's some early uh, information about why this was a non-ribosomal peptide, and again, this came from Wayne Carmichael's lab in Wright State University, Ohio. He found that there was phosphopantothenal activity within microcystis cells that produce toxins, and he also, the structure, he, he was uh, determining, and I guess we're going, but this is back work with uh, Ken Reinhardt, is that the structure does not contain natural amino acids. It has these D-form amino acids, plus they're highly modified amino acids. You guys can't see that coming up all the time, so it's good. I'll just keep clicking it. It's some message from the other side. <laughs> um, oh, the, the, other, the other interesting uh, experiment that Wayne Carmichael did uh, with um, Tony, anyone? No, it was one of his students, Anthony, I oh, forgot, he's, he's got out of uh, cyanobacterial. He's an orchid breeder now, actually. <laughs> Probably even a better job than I've got. But um, the other interesting uh, experiment they did was treat microcystis cells with an antibiotic, I think it was chloramphenicol or ampicillin, which actually shut down the ribosome. So if you shut down the ribosome, you continue to see production of um, micro, uh, microcystin, therefore saying it's a non-ribosomal peptide. Very nice experiment from a from a phycologist. Um, he's really a chemist. So, I, as I said, the, the the class of these organisms is you know when I when I first worked on on this project, I was thinking, gee, it must be a really small gene that makes that really little protein. Um, this is the, you know the thinking something twenty something years ago, twenty five years ago. 
but there actually was a fair, fair amount of work done there by, by Germans, uh, particularly in terms of vitamin biosynthesis, the biosynthesis of penicillin, for example, and then, uh, of course, some of the bacillus antibiotics like gramicidin or surfactin, tyrosidin, um, and again, some, some other uh, molecules you might have heard of, cyclosporin, which is produced by a fungus, and it's, it's used very widely as an immunosuppressant. So you do know these, we do know these uh, compounds, but we don't know of them as being, we know of them being important for infection, etc. but we didn't have any clue that might be a relation between, you know, these things we use as antibiotics, like penicillin, and toxins in cyanobacteria. And in fact, the first paper I read was written in German, but you know, you know science, most of the good things are all written in the same language. It's just that the discussions that you know, go on and on about nothing. As, being a chemist is great, you don't have to worry about discussion sections. <laughs> so uh, I guess just an important background slide about this whole, the whole biosynthesis, because it is a real central issue to this seminar is that the biosynthesis is based on these very large enzymes that themselves are actually ribosomally produced, right? So this is, you know, it's, it's kind of a concept when you have, when you talk to, not that you guys or anything like this, but when you talk to second year grad students or undergrad students, they've had it drilled into them that there's transcription, translation, boom, that's it. But this is an, there's an interim step here after the translation to get the enzymes, the, the multi-enzyme complex, those enzymes then make another small molecule protein peptide. And the, the enzymes themselves are modular, and each module encodes or will recruit one amino acid, for example. If you look at the structure of microcystin, being a cyclic peptide, seven amino acids there, there's seven modules present to recruit the amino acids and to con condense them. And each of those modules have a specific function in terms of whether it's the adenylation or the recruitment of the amino acid, uh, the tethering to the complex, and then the condensation to the next amino acid, so the growing chain. And not to complicate issues too much, but this is the same thing that happens in fatty acid synthesis and uh, polyketide synthesis as well. So I won't dwell too much on the polyketide synthesis, even though when we talk about peptide and polyketide synthesis, they're very similar in terms of the architecture of the modules and domains, which usually just the substrates being carboxyl versus amino or hydroxyl acids. So yeah, and this is the uh, this is the slide I like to say costs the lives of about four four grad students, and you know, <laughs> so it, it's it, accumulatively it's probably about you know 15 years of research, but you know, I guess five students in in Berlin and in Sydney working on this project. And this is in the days when we didn't have genome sequencing. Well, we did, but it was all being used for one very important cause. Right. See, that was sarcasm. <laughs> the, the eye roll is a good giveaway to the webinar. People can't see that. <laughs> but this is a very large gene cluster that we, couldn't, we didn't have the genome for. We had to walk it. So there's an old technique called genome walking by PCR. And we, we uh, had to sequence this roughly 70 kilobase region of the microcystis or microcystis originosa genome, and it's it's uh, it's a single copy in that genome. We were, and we were lucky, right? Because if you look at that genome now, there's multiple examples of non-ribosomal peptide synthetases in that genome. We just got lucky when we did our first PCR degenerate PCR based on like a gramicidin from Bacillus, the genes for gramicidin synthesis. We use roughly the same primer set and we found the right one. We could have easily picked up another one called cyanopeptylin um, or originosin from the same genome. And then there's, you know, there's mul multiple enzy enzymatic steps, about 25 enzymatic steps that all go towards production. So these are the enzymatic steps in these arrows here producing this toxin. One enzyme for one, one little uh, addition to the structure. And then uh, work that we did in Berlin with Elke Dittmann was the fact that we could mutate the genome by insertional inactivation, in, uh, basically incorporating an antibiotic cassette. And that knocks out specifically the um, micro, microcystin. Um, and there's two analogues of microcystin in, in this strain of microcystis originosa. 
So both of those were knocked out, but the other non-ribosomal peptides were not affected. So here we have cyanopeptin, for example, and these are the microcystins uh, knocked out. So in more detail, I should just go back one, uh, two, just just to let you know, this this is what I refer to as the ADA side chain. It's a polyketide side chain, and it's widely um, recognised as being where the bioactivity, where the protein phosphatase inhibition is coming from in the, the effect of this toxin. The, the cyclic peptide ring here is, is probably uh, a, the carrier molecule and which probably gets the bioactivity to the liver. So a lot of publications would, would uh, and this is coming out of U USF, saying that this cyclic peptide structure is binding to some bile acid transporters, organic ion anion transporters in bile, carrying it from the, the bloodstream directly to the liver, where this polyketide side chain is binding to protein phosphatase and inhibiting things, or so hyperphosphorylating um, uh, cell membrane um, components like actin, which then leads to uh, liver hemorrhage. In, that's in the acute form of the toxicity. In the, in the chronic form of the toxicity, it's leading to tumour promotion. So that at a side chain, that polyketide side chain is uh, initiated here with, with an amino acid and then extended through carboxyl uh, additions. And then the, what's really important to remember here is this amino transfer, sorry, not, Tim told me not to turn my head, this amino transfer um, which actually puts this side chain onto the cyclic peptide backbone. So. For later in the talk, when I'm talking about using this as a water, water management tool, the amino transfer is a really important issue. And this is simply the, uh, the other side of the reaction uh, where we've got the production of the cyclic peptide ring just by sequential additions of amino acid to this growing chain. It's then cleaved and cyclized, and then you have the final microcystin structure. I don't know if I've already said, I don't think I showed you this, but the, the actual gene cluster um, has a central promoter. And if you look to your left on the screen, this is all the polyketide synthesis for that adder side chain. And on the right here is the uh, peptide, cyclic peptide backbone. So there's a central promoter region here. And what's interesting in terms of regulation of the, um, the microsystem um, gene cluster is that the promoter actually has multiple um, motifs that are activated, well the transcription is uh, regulated by light at two different regions. So obviously when you're looking at these things at a molecular level, light, and this is probably fairly obvious in thinking about cyanobacteria, is that light has an effect on the production of microcystin. But what I want to show as well on this, um, on this slide, there's also a few uh, enzymes in here which we call tailoring enzymes and in particular one down here called MCYH which is, and this happens a lot with uh, non-ribosomal non peptides or, or their gene clusters, is that you'll find these transporter molecules embedded in them. And again, it, and, um, if there's any new undergrad students in the audience or even fresh grad students, you probably don't know what a northern transfer is, right? So this is uh, equivalent to an RT-PCR, but it, obviously these are these are if just an old man's lesson. These are heaps more accurate than RT-PCR and very much easier to interpret. Um, but we looked at growth of microcystis under different levels of light, and again, this is with um, Elka's, Elka's group in Berlin, Elka Dittmann, looking at the light regulation, showing the upregulation of transcription of that gene cluster. So highlight, and you know, you can be, it's debatable what, what, is a, what is highlight, but we were using roughly these 70 micromoles, photons per second, as being highlight. And I don't know if you guys experience this on the Great Lakes. I'm not quite sure of your in, uh, irradiance levels. Someone can tell me later. We definitely see these levels in Australia, but I gave this lecture once in the UK, and they go, no, we don't, we'd never see that. So. So they'll never get you know transcriptional regulation by light, say in the UK. 
but also looking at that central promoter region, there's other um, DNA binding motifs or regu regulatory motifs in that region that are uh, the fur. These are fur boxes. They're called iron uptake regulator motifs, iron as in FE, and then this NTCA, which is a, it's a, it's a global regulator um, controlled by nitrogen uh, metabolism. So again, we have light as being one regulator of toxin biosynthesis, or I should say microcystin biosynthesis, and we also have iron and nitrogen. So this is just some clues from the molecular level about what could be regulating production of the toxin. And this is all information that's coming from the genomics or the genetics of the, the toxin biosynthesis. Now kind of like in a summary of that, that part of the uh, seminar is that we have um, we have transcriptional regulators that have now been proven by uh, things like transcriptomics and proteomics studies that things like light and iron and nitrogen do indeed have a role in the regulation of toxin production. And, but if you look at that in an environmental sense, it's probably things like the, uh, the depth where, where you're seeing the bloom occur in the water and, and that will then affect the the, both the quality and the quantity of the light that's being instant on the, on the bloom cells. We don't think that the, it's, it's a direct effect, but it's probably having something to do with photosynthesis. And this is, this is kind of related to where you see microcystin being localized uh, in, within the cell. And it's typically on the thylakoid membrane or the in, intercellular membrane. So there's some link to, direct link to photosynthesis there. I should say that the, this is all very, uh, uh, putative in terms of the, the, the predictions here because not all microcystis cells produce microcystin so any broad uh, broad conclusion it can always be shot down by your favorite reviewer um, <laughs> but one one thing and I think I said this earlier on is that the even though there's incredible genetic conservation within all cyanobacteria and particularly within things like microcystis you do have this potential for regional specificity and adaptation to, to niche um, environments. The, the other point about microcystin, and it's a kind of, it's, it acts as a weak siderophore, so it can bind uh, divalent cations, uh, in particular iron, um, but it's, it's not a strong siderophore either. And this could have some role on photosynthesis in the terms of the, the role of the photosystem and possibly nitrogen fixation in those species that fix nitrogen. So microcystin is not only produced by microcystis, and I'm, I'm getting to that interesting point. Of the, one of the old theories was uh, microcystin is a feeding deterrent, and you know it probably is, but it's not obviously not the evolutionary basis for it because there was no humans around when uh, microcystin probably evolved. So that's, it, 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 it's one of these, it's like the effect on our livers, it's just in, coincidental. And then there's work going on again in Germany that microcystin could act as a signaling molecule. So that the interesting point about the transcription of microcystin synthetase, the whole gene cluster, is that yes, the transcription does increase with higher light. Um, with the restriction of things like iron, you'll get high, higher transcription as well. But in particular with higher light, you might, you might see higher transcription, but you don't see any more toxin being produced. It seems like the, the, the level of toxin being produced is constitutive and basal and considering it's such a complicated pathway, it would cost a lot of energy to actually modify that level of production. So the cell quotas are not very different when you look at all the different strains of, of microcystis around the world. You're probably only getting be between a, a like within a five-fold change of uh, toxin quota per cell. And again, when you look at the transcription, you don't see massive changes like hundredfold in, say, in the human uh, gene transcriptions. Uh, you see hundredfold transcription, transcriptional changes. We're only seeing around fivefold transcriptional changes at that level when you're seeing exposure to high light. One of the things you don't see is more toxin being produced is because of this, that transporter molecule that I showed you. You also see increased transcription of transport genes at the same level as you see increased transcription of biosynthesis genes. So the conclusion from that work was that the toxin is not 
it, 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 there's more being produced, but it's actually being exported out of the cell. And this is still very debatable because a lot of people will say, you see toxin outside of the cell when cells lies. But there are, there are method, ways of measuring that, just like measuring total protein in, in the supernatant of a culture, for example. So my laboratory would stand by the fact that we have active transport. The only problem is we haven't, in terms of the structural biology, the, the actual recognition of the transporter, ABC transporter, with microcystin, that has not been proven or has not been shown conclusively. But again, that the, the, just the simple fact that when you get higher transcription of the toxin by synthesis, you see more toxin outside the cell is another water quality or drinking water management issue. So another point about regulation, another point about uh, what, what do you consider when you're using this genetic information for uh, real world uh, drinking water, water quality management is the fact that apart from you know the biosynthesis of using all these peptide and polyketide synthase genes, there's a central promoter region that shows you what might be regulating it, but they also have what the, we call the flanking regions of this genetic locus. Uh, what, what are they typically involved in? And, and some of them are hypothetical, some like DNAN's probably involved in uh, some sort of uh, DNA replication. And, and interestingly, when you ever see, whenever you see this uh, gene cluster in any strain of microcystis around the world, it's always inserted into this one place of one part of the genome. But up here in these unknown genes, there is actually a transposase as well. So these transposase is proposed to be important for the integration and mobilization of the whole gene cluster within the microcystis genome, but po possibly also between different strains of microcystis and possibly even other cyanobacteria. Again, these are very hard, very hard uh, experiments to perform and, and to get conclusions from. But we have shown that UV, for example, and that this is using UVC, which is not very common, again, on Earth, unless you've got an ozone hole like Australia. Um, well, yeah, we've got all the toxic species and snakes and whatever, and an ozone hole. So, <laughs> And we've got really bad beer. That's, that's why that's, I, could have done, I could have done this webinar by, from Sydney, right? But the beer's better here in Michigan. <laughs> Simple things. Um, but you do see UVC radiation will in, in, uh, enhance the transcription of this transposase that flanks the microcystin synthesis genes. So if you know about molecular microbiology, bacteriology, if you get a more active transposase, you're probably going to get rearrangement of the of the that, that genome or gene the gene cluster that's that it's around. It's kind of being carried. And in fact, when they put out the um, microcystis originosa first genome, there was one done in Europe and one done in Japan almost identically. There's a hundred, at least a hundred transposon or transposases in those genomes. So the conclusion would be, unless they're all inactive, that that genome is very malleable, plastic. So, and the issue here is in terms of, uh, I guess, toxicity and, and man again, management, is that there's about 70 isoforms of microcystin, maybe more, they keep, people keep finding more. Um, all those isoforms of that one molecule have variable toxicities. So if we're seeing genome rearrangement, and um, particularly, in these two amino acids down here, typically we, we have microcystin LR. If you're doing any HPLC, you'll use microcystin LR as the standard. And these, these two amino acids here are, are hypervariable. Um, so you can have LR, LA, LY, RR, FR, depending on the amino acids at those positions. And they all have different toxicities to, to humans, or to animals, I should say. Um, and this, this is predicted to be something to do either with the, the relaxed specificity of these adenylation domains. As I said, these, these are the domains within the module that recruit the amino acid. So they could just be relaxed and they pick up leucine or arginine, They're not re they don't really care. Um, but ov obviously it leads to a different toxicity. Or these modules or, these, or domains can actually rearrange due to transposition, for example, or some type of recombination. And on a, on a, I guess on a grosser level, a, a, 
intergenomic uh, in, rather than an intragenomic um, recombination is that we've also found, and this is in collaboration with um, Stanford University again, and looking at how actual genes could be transferred, transferred between microcystis. So the early work that was done um, showed that microcystis is naturally transformable. Um, but the, the, the evidence from about 10 years ago shows that microcystis actually has type 4 pili structures, which allows this to happen. And I guess if you can focus just on here, the classic example of pili connecting two cells, and this is what, how genetic exchange can happen uh, in the wild. It's, um, the pili also used to take up DNA, or sorry, not just DNA, any macromolecule from the environment as a nutrient. So this was, this was an interesting finding. We kind of knew this was happening in cyanobacteria like uh, Sinica cystis, for example, where that's been used continually as like the lab rat of uh, doing genetic work in cyanobacteria. But this is the first time it was shown in microcystis. And Davis reckons it's his hand. You have it? I was also always told it was the hand of Cod. <laughs> so Jeff Cod, no? No, okay. <laughs> So he reckons it's his hand. It looks old though. Um, but you, you look, you not, sorry Jeff, if you're listening, it's not that old. But, um, and so th you see in this situation where you get mass, mass bloom proliferation and like the, they, they die essentially. When they get there, you get this photo oxidation effect happening or bleaching. The cells lies and die. In that situation, you've got so much of the DNA out in the environment that if you've got this natural competence, uh, the, the type 4 pili structures, you could, could very well imagine genes being taken up quite, quite readily and some retained. Now remember that because a bloom, as I'll show you later on, a bloom is not clonal. When, you, when a lot of, I used to think, when you've got a toxic bloom, you think there's one strain of microcystis originosa present that's producing toxin and that turns out to be completely untrue. Um, so, I think I mentioned before, it's not just microcystis that produces microcystin, even though it was uh, so well named, very original. Um, microcystis is also, microcystin, sorry, is also produced by Sinica cystis in, in Brazil, by Anabina in Finland, Oscillatoria in Europe, uh, Planktothrix in a uh, place like Austria, help me out here, Great Lakes, Planktothrix, microcystis. Anabina? No. But you know, so I guess the point is, is if, you, if you're like me, an old time microbiologist, you look down a microscope, and remember those photos I showed you early on with all the different morphologies, you got no clue which one's toxic, okay? And I know people say that, you know, there's people around the world, there's great uh, cyanobacterial taxonomists around the world that use microscopes, and don't get me wrong, 99% of the time they get it right, that they, they, their morphological, morphological description matches the genetic description of a, of a strain or a species. But in terms of, you, there's only about three people in the world like that, so you can't have all these, you can't have one in every operational laboratory. If, you're, if you see an anabina down a microscope, I would say, oh, you've got a potential for saxitoxin, because I come from Sydney, Australia. If I see microcystis, I'm going to say microcystin, but if you see anabina in, say, Europe, you're going to, or Finland, you're going to assume microcystin. So it's a completely, this is a, it's a whole like issue of, you can't judge the book by its cover. And then the, the more people go out and look at these things, and you know, the, I think the last one, the sphere of carbon, for example, I think comes from a lichen, right? So who would have thought lichens also, also produce microcystin? It was always thought of as being an aquatic toxin but no, we're finding, finding it in terrestrial environments, environments as well. And the gene, the, all the gene clusters in the anabinas, the planktothrix, whatever, they all contain the same enzymes or the same genes, but they're all rearranged. They're all sh being shuffled about. So the, the acquisition of the genes has happened randomly over evolutionary time. Uh, I guess the, the latest theory would be that the um, oscillatorialis, like the planktothrix, etc., were the origination, or, or, origins of the toxins, uh, the toxin genes, 
and then around about the same time with the Krukakalis or the Microcystis, and then somehow along the way they've gone into the uh, to the Anabina type, the Nostocalis group, um, essentially because that's just a, a, a younger group of cyanobacteria by phylogeny that is. And the last point here, nodularia, which I'll just go to, go to now, which is an interesting aspect in terms of the evolution, is that nodularin is microcystin with two amino acids taken out. So there's been a gene deletion happening. Microcystin has had a gene deletion where one of the, the, the peptide synthetase genes have been deleted. So you've lost two amino acids. Two modules went, two amino acids went. Nodularia, as I showed, as I said earlier, is found in these, like in the Baltic region, that the blooms in the brackish water of the Baltic and southern Australia, you find it. You guys wouldn't see it. Maybe at the St. Lawrence, where it's more brackish, never been recorded, possibly. I've never heard of it, but yeah, these, these two parts of the world um, where you find nodularia and nodularin. So nodularin is only found in one species of nodularia as well whereas microcystin is found in all those different genera. So, it's just, sorry, this is just the gene cluster with these peptide synthetase genes with one or, sorry, two modules deleted. And again, you see the, the, the flanking genes that uh, regulate the production. So, we have things like, again, the HLIP, this open reading frame here, is highlight inducible protein, saying same sort of regulation happening. And not nodularia, is not to, to our knowledge not naturally competent, but it can it can be uh, transformed by conjugation. So conjugation doesn't happen, uh, to my knowledge, that that uh, much in the in the wild or in the environment. So we're saying that the nodularia anabina have a, a, is a group of cyanobacteria that have probably evolved from the, the other filamentous cyanobacteria, the oscillatorialis, and and taken toxin genes with them. So that's more of a, a vertical transmission of the, of the toxin genes, whereas in terms of between things like microcystis strains, you might be seeing more horizontal transfer via that type 4 pili or the competence, the natural competence. Now, I can't see the time. Half past? Sorry, what'd you say in Australian? Quarter, quarter pounds? All right, I better move because I've been told to give the uh, the people sitting at home their um, their time to ask questions. Cylindrospermopsin. Actually, I probably won't go through cylindrospermopsin too much because it's not such a huge issue around here. Probably down southern southern states, Florida, Florida, for example. Um, but again, the genetics of what we knew about microcystin just led on to the genetics of cylindrospermopsin because they're made by peptide and polyketide synthetases again. So it was quite a, a simple step to go from one biosynthetic pathway to another for a, for a completely different type of toxin. And the regulation of this toxin is probably, again, something to do with nitrogen. Cylindrospermopsis fixes nitrogen. When, it's, when, it, when it doesn't have a fixed nitrogen source, it produces more toxin. And then the latest, the, the latest toxin um, that the genetics have been done on, sorry, anatoxin is the latest, but I won't talk about that. We've done the work on the saxitoxin biosynthesis, found the genes in the freshwater organisms here, that, like inland Australia and uh, Brazil and um, the Tennessee River, I believe where you have Lingbia woolii blooms was one of the, one of the uh, samples we worked on and, and now are in, from Athena zamenin in uh, northern Europe. So you find these freshwater org organisms, they're all cyanobacterial producing saxitoxin, but then you have all the, the coastal um, dinoflagellates producing the same toxin. So and if, when I was, I like to harp on a bit about the, uh, the gene transfer issue. And this is the only example in uh, natural sciences or biological sciences where you've got a gene transferred from a prokaryote to a eukaryote, uh, hor probably horizontally. It could have happened during the endosymb endosymbiosis events where the ac via the acquisition of chloroplasts uh, or possibly not. But this is probably the only example of a secondary metabolite 
bad word, but a small bioactive molecule being transferred from the prokaryotes to the eukaryotes. So then the structure of saxitoxin, you know, a lot of the work we've done, the proposals that we've done on the biosynthesis that led to the, the, the discovery of the genetics of the biosynthesis all came from, you know, very, very good um, feeding studies of, um, by chemists. And this is originally by Shimizu. And then the pathway again discovered. And the, 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 I guess the, the good thing and the bad thing about saxitoxin is when we walked that um, gene pathway is that it's small. So, but it turns, about, it turns out to be a bad thing um, because saxitoxin is you know, the, like the number two biochemical weapon. So it's in terms of cloning these gene clusters, which is obviously uh, necessary for things like production of standards for use in analytical laboratories, but also the cloning of them could be a potential risk in terms of uh, biosecurity. Again, we find these genes in the saxitoxin pathway that relate to its regulation and the FO2 component system is one example where phosphate is found to regulate. Um, again, this slide's very, very uh, messy. What we've got down here in the blue are known cyanobacterial homologs or genes, and in black, they're not, they're not cyanobacterial at all. So the saxitoxin pathway looks like uh, uh, a combination of genes acquired from different types of bacteria originally. I think there's even an archaeal gene in there somewhere. So again, with, when we talk about the geographic distribution and these regional specific uh, idiosyncrasies, I guess, is that when you look at Slindrospermopsis from Brazil, which produces saxitoxin, has this protein, uh, sorry, phosphate regula regulator, but the anabena in Australia that produces saxitoxin is not regulated by phosphate. And in, in it, what we've done from Australian strains of um, uh, saxitoxin producers shows a direct correlation between the concentration of sodium, or I should say conductance, not necessarily salt. Conductivity is directly related to the level of saxitoxin production. And that probably goes to back to the fact that saxitoxin itself blocks our sodium channels, our uh, sodium channels in our neurons. So there's some, there's some co-evolution happening here, and we talk about it in one of our papers uh, published in Molecular Biology Evolution, where sodium channels and potassium channels in animals, or sorry, in bacteria, have probably co-evolved to some extent with these small molecules that block the same channels. So I just want to finish quickly on how all this information, the genetics behind the production, the genetics behind the regulation, the genetics behind the gene transfer, etc., all can be used uh, within an operational sense of for water quality management. And that, that, see, that's, that's just what I've kind of, that's a summary of what I've described so far, right? I've confused everyone. Good? I, I just like saying these Latin words. No, I don't. <laughs> so conventionally, people use microscopy. They use the bioassays, the mouse bioassay, which is now illegal in most countries that I, that I travel to anyway. Uh, the ELISA or the protein phosphate inhibition assay look for the activity of the toxins, um, obviously different for the neurotoxins, and then now the use of LCMS types of um, analytical techniques. The molecular targets we used originally were all about phylogeny, and as you know, as I've just said, phylogeny has no relationship to what toxins are being produced by these cyanobacteria. So we want to look at the actual genes that I've shown you that are related to biosynthesis. So the detection of the cyclic peptide, for example, remember I said about the amino transfer, it puts that bio, it puts the responsible bioactivity to the carrier cyclic peptide. That connection, we're saying, is, is a critical point in the biosynthesis. Could be the first amino acid in the cyclic peptide, but that's a very conserved protein in itself. So you could also have other non-ribosomal peptides that have very similar enzymes and genes. We're saying the amino transfer is unique to that molecule in, in cyanobacteria, or in toxic cyanobacteria. So if you, we, we target that as a, as a method for um, detecting toxigenic strains in the environment. 
and we've, that's been now adapted for, uh, sorry, quantitative PCR and also for measuring gene expression in the environment. And funnily enough, when I go back to this slide, there, is a, there was a reference there, it's down the bottom. We published a paper in late 2006 describing the use of MCYE, that's the amino transfer enzyme, the gene behind the amino transfer. Published that in late 2006 and in 2007 there's a massive bloom in Sydney. This is weird, right? Uh, <laughs> um, see, this, this water body in Sydney never had a toxic bloom. Well, for, as far as I can remember. But, I, you know, a good, good old friend of mine, Wayne Carmichael as well, he used to travel a lot around the world. Everywhere he went, there was a toxic bloom. <laughs> I'm not blaming him for it, but you can get a career out of that stuff. <laughs> so we had this bloom event in Sydney, and um, for all intents and purposes, if you look at it down a microscope, that is a toxic bloom event with the cell numbers, etc. So what do you do? You shut down the water supply for five million people. Um, you can't really shut down a water supply for that many people, even though a lot of people in the eastern suburbs of Sydney take showers in Perrier. Um, <laughs> that's the rich area, right, where, where Mark lives now. But um, so the, the, the one day before, a couple of days before, they had to shut this down just for, you know, or, or slip in very expensive membrane filtration. That we, had, we had no idea that this was a non-toxic um, bloom. So like I said, this is the, we were in drought for a long time. We have this El Nino effect in Australia. Uh, you, you guys don't get affected by that sort of stuff, right? <laughs> so we have droughts. Um, you guys just have bad winters sometimes. But we had drought, and so the water level was down, right, 80, what I say, is down to really low levels. Then we, perfect for a bloom to set up. The nutrients were all, we were um, loaded with phosphate, water, water going down, and this, this bloom happened. So we had, to, we had to move from strategic to operational very quickly, even though at a research laboratory within a university, you're not allowed to do so. So we examined the, the bloom population. Uh, the Australian government's allowed to. I don't know if your government can do that, but the Australian government can access my emails, um, which they did. So we were sending emails back and forth to the regulatory authority saying, yeah, we've tested this and here's our results. So we wanted to work out, knowing what we could do with the qPCR about the toxin gene, is look at the fact so that there is microcystis there, but is it the toxigenic species? Knowing fully well that we've tested hundreds of microcystis from around the world, and approximately half of them have toxin genes. Half of the microcystis you find are just, well, they can't be toxic, they don't have toxin genes. So we were doing the qPCR, sorry, this is first looking at the, the cell numbers um, by 6NS ribosomal, ribosomal RNA, qPCR, uh, compared to cell counts, and they matched up really well, right? So we were, we were quite happy that the PCR is not being inhibited by anything, and then we look at the level of toxin genes in this population. So the, num the numbers of microcysts is not changing that much, but the level of uh, the toxic population or the potentially toxic population very drastically within the half a year that we monitored this bloom. And particularly on the day before they were about to shut down the water supply, we said we, c we can only find 1% of, of the population of microcystis actually had a toxin gene, and the highest level of toxin that could produce would be X. So we know that the highest level of toxin ever produced is about 5 femtograms per cell. And if we found a toxin gene, that would equate roughly to that amount. But then you shove in a 10 times factor because it's just a lot better for safety. Um, but if you can see, can you see the yellow line? Probably a bad colour. But you can see that the percentage of the population that was toxigenic or had a toxin gene it increased incredibly in, in the, within January, which is our hottest month of the year. So as summer went on, the toxic population, the toxigenic population increased. When, when we initially tested it, the toxigenic population was only about 1% of the microcystis present. And the analytical methods actually then validated this and was the HPLC. The, the toxin being produced, by the way, was a new isoform of microcystin. 
And the good thing about the PCR, the design of the PCR, is that it does pick up all those different isoforms or the pathways that produce all those different isoforms. So the conclusions were that what, what was traditionally considered a high alert toxic bloom, just by cell numbers, cell numbers of microcystis, was not necessarily because what we do, what we could say is that the population is not toxigenic. It cannot be producing toxin. So it, it, was, it was a nice microcystis. So the, the prediction value is incredible. You know, when we're looking at um, when we're looking at water bodies that have no observed bloom, for example, or rivers, we can now go to water and or even I, th I think actually sediments are the things to look at. And I'm talking to Tim about the same thing. So you can go out to your lakes and sample sediments, and I would say there are spots or regions within tributaries, for example, of a lake that you could find that are the feeders or you could find dormant populations in lakes that, I know this, the, the, you could dredge these areas, right, and get rid of that, um, what I call a feeder population. You could probably dredge and get rid of those populations. You know, it's, it's an engineering feat again, but it's probably a whole lot better than dumping in algocytes and cop or copper sulfate, for example, or having to put up with a bloom. So yeah, and the treatment strategy is really important too. When you when you've got toxic cyanobacteria online, you've got to put in the activated uh, carbons and membrane filtration. It becomes a lot more expensive rather than just doing you know the fil normal uh, coarse filtration to get rid of cells that a lot of uh, water authorities would prefer to use. That that one test has now led to a multiplex of tests. All those uh, toxin genes I've talked about are now put into one. PCR and some work done um, recently uh, again with Tim and on a grant with Tim and, uh, from the NSF with Paul Zimmer and Judy Westrick and the work some of the technical work done by Alex Chu um, who I admit came from my lab I hope he's not listening um, but this multiplex of tests now can actually show you what toxin genes are present in a, a one sample and we did some work in Australia um, a while back, a couple of years back now, where one of our major rivers, the Murray River, actually had all four, to oh, sorry, three toxins present at the same time. Um, admittedly, at very small levels for things like cylindrospermopsin, but still the potential's there for those, for those small populations to become greater populations when, um, when different nutrient loads um, occur, for example. So, my future work that I'm interested in is what are the role of these toxins, um, and 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 some, I, am, I haven't got time to talk about it now, but I can talk about it other, uh, after. There's other, not just abiotic factors affecting what toxins are present in, in a particular water body at a particular particular time of year. There's also biotic factors, and these biotic factors typically are other bacteria that living in commensalism with the cyanobacteria. And these are just, again, some of the water bodies that we've worked on in Australia. Um, this, this is what I was going to say about the interaction between abiotic and biotic factors uh, being analysed via, say, uh, uh, deep pyrose sequencing to see what populations are, are present of, of the whole microbial consortia um, and, and overlaying that with uh, things like elemental analysis and um, and again, toxicity and things like chlorophyll and what, what can be a good marker. This is all analysed by you know, Pearson's correlation and a network analysis. So that's it. it does, sorry, I had to rush at the end because this is all like really just stuff that's unpublished. And I know some guys around um, in the United States, particularly a friend uh, Steve Wilhelm, is doing this exact type of stuff. So this is a new way of looking at what, uh, what's controlling blooms and, and actually what's promoting toxic blooms because blooms themselves, as I said early up, oxygen, oxygenate our atmosphere. So we don't necessarily want to algocide the lot of them. I'd like to say that the work was funded by the Sydney Catchment Authority and Sydney Water Corporation initially. Those are the, the strategic thinking government authorities, the Australian Research Council and the New South Wales Office of Water most recently. And diagnostic technology has provided, uh, I guess, the, the technology for, to now do this multiplex testing. And of course, the many grad students that I've murdered along the way. Thank you very much. Sorry it went so long. Your introduction was too long, Tim. 
Do you want to do the webinars first? There's none. One question was, uh, what do you think the role of microsystem is in ROS scavenging, which is that latest theory coming out? Okay. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. The, the classic question, what is the role of microsystem? I just told you, we don't know. <laughs> yeah, with, um, with the um, free radical production and microsystem, but my personal theory, and we're still working on this, I don't have, we don't have much information, but again, it would, to me, it would go to the fact that it's a siderophore, it's going out to collect uh, re reduced iron, so there's oxidised iron in the, in the cell uh, occurring via this uh, production of free radicals as a, uh, I guess, as a, as a result of photosynthesis. Iron can be, iron's then uh, transferred out of the cell and microsystem potentially can uh, take up reduced iron from outside the cell. Um, uh, so the uh, Fe2, there's the, uh, the, we're also looking at the um, ferric uh, reductases on the outer cell surface of these cells um, within the, you know, because microcystis is in these colonies that have a mucilage around them, so it's kind of a reduced environment happening there. Um, we're saying microcystin can possibly uh, Re scavenge reduced iron from the external uh, environment to be used in processes like photosynthesis um, and possibly in nitrogen uh, fixation in the, in the organisms that have that ability. Is that kind of right? I don't know. Yeah, of course it is, Brett. You're, you're always right. <laughs> That's my theory. George. Uh, given the uh, importance or the proposed importance of all the transposases, uh, there should be a very serious effort in sequencing as many different microcystis genomes to look at gene synteny and, and genome structure and how, how, how truly plastic it is. So mm. wh where are we there right now? Microcystis, for some reason, has fallen off the radar, I think, because you know, we, we kind of assume a lot of it's done. But that, for that same, that there's only two strains that I know of that have the genome. It's the 7806 and the NIES strain. Yeah, it's still. Why is that? Yeah, I don't know. So you should blame people like me for that, because I, you know, stupidly I went and did a well, again with Tim. We did the project where we sequenced about 10 or 12 cylindros, sorry, cylindros bimopsin producing genomes. Uh, so it's Raffidiopsis, Cylindros Pomopsis, from China and Australia. Is that that's it? So we're looking at looking at this uh, longitudinal type study. Uh, we, you know, again, we're talking about Cylindros Pomopsis being in, an invasive species rather than so having this geographic temperate to subtropical distribution now and looking what any differences are. We. But we did see, again, we did see a lot of transposases in those genomes. Didn't necessarily look at um, the differences in, say, the quantifying transposases. It's, it'd be quite an easy thing to do. And um, you could do $2,000 worth of, you'd have 20 microcystis genomes. I think it's a great idea, in particular, that you could do the non-toxigenic strains, right, and then the toxic, uh, toxigenic strains from a single environment. And they're quite easy to get in culture too. Or you just do them, I don't know, you can't really, couldn't really do a metagenome, you have to have cultures, yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> but again, because microcystis is such a cosmopolitan um, sp issue, species, that yeah, that's fantastic. That, no, that idea would be great, but particularly when it might relate to things like incidence of light or potential UV with thinner atmospheres and stuff like that. You've all got to get back to work, right? <laughs> Talk too long. <laughs> I've got a question, John Bratton from NOAA. Um, Based on, on work that you mentioned briefly in Shark Bay and, and other 
kinds of extreme environments, hot springs and saline rivers and other sorts of things. Um, it seems that some of those those habitats are kind of throwback communities to the Precambrian. Um, is there, have you seen value in, in your own work or in other people's work in, in looking at those as, as kind of turn the clock back? How did these systems originally uh, prove advantageous uh, and not get distracted by the fact that they happen to be yeah. you know, coincident liver toxins, you know, billions of years later? Yeah, that's a great, great idea. I get coming from my first postdoc working on those stromatolites um, really makes you aware that you know what we're looking at today and forget the fact that all this work was done in laboratories right so in a way it's all wrong it's got nothing to do with what happens in the environment we've got to, we've got to, as as environmental microbiologists we've got to start doing these experiments in the environment and we're talking about things like ESPs and whatever the Collect, just collecting samples and preserving them from the environment is a f one great step. But then realizing that the Earth changes, you know, we talk about climate change all the time. You know, there's two types of climate change. There's one that's happened since Earth began, and there's one that happened in the last couple hundred years. The the oceans used to be saltier, right? So yeah, you had different types of um, you know proton pumps and whatever this sort of issues happening. It's 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 interesting for me to think how many of these toxins were around and now just uh, extinct. Well, the, the 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 lines of cyanobacteria they're just not on Earth anymore. For example, you know the ones that killed the dinosaurs. You know, well, that's just another one of my theories. But <laughs> you get funding for that. <laughs> no, no, um, to, to tell the undergrad, undergrad students things like that to, just to make them think. No, it's it's a great concept. I mean, you know, I think everyone should be in say in my line of work environmental microbiology should be thinking that way that we're not what we see out there today is not necessarily what happens it could be a vestige of what used to happen or it could be on the on the you know the upward growth of you know becoming a major new and as we well, with cylindrospermopsis right when i was first working on this you hardly heard about it and then in the last 20 years it's everyone's reporting it and a lot of people would say but you know more people look at cyanobacteria i just i don't think it's as simple as that and, you know, 20 years ago, there's some great, there's great people, like I said, Yuri Kumarik and Wayne Carmichael. They were out there looking at all this, and you know, the my, my, microscopists and the chemists were certainly doing the same sort of work we're doing, or I'm, I, I'm doing, but I'm just looking at it from a different genetic level, finding out the same information. Um, I, yeah, I, that's one of my slides. I don't know if I mentioned it, but. Yeah, the the role of the toxins is still what the science that drives the work I do. And when I say toxins, um, I'm going to speak to a great um, scientist at uh, UMICH, uh, Dave Sherman, about when I say toxins, it's any bioactive substance. You know, a, a drug that we take is a toxin. We take, you know, um, the, Cyanobacteria produce so many natural products, and it's just they're totally underexplored. Like a, a whole range of different bacteria are totally underexplored in terms of what uh, bioactive substances they can provide us for pharmacy, for example. But what do they do in terms of the ecology of the organism, the ecophysiology of the organism? And this is really hard science, I, I believe, because you have to do that in the environment. You can't really do that in the laboratory. Is where we we've got this. Uh, anthropogenic attitude, we name things like secondary metabolites because, oh well, you can take it away and they still stay alive. Therefore they're useless. Uh, but now we'll make a billion dollars out of it and sell it. But you know, to, to actually find out what they do in the environment, I, I believe it's really hard science. I think that that's probably going to be the next generation of, you know, the next big wave of science is seeing what happens in, in its environment. You know, and probably when you look at medical research too, it's heading that way, you know what happens, you can't really take things out of context and assume, assume they have the same responses. So, and it's a good thing too, is been get more ship time and stuff like that. We don't have more, less time in the laboratory, I reckon. Not that I do any experiments these days. <laughs> well, again, just torturing students. But <laughs> Thank you for the talk. I'm Marianne Evans from the US Geological Survey. Um, you mentioned that because of the simultaneous upregulation of the production genes and the transporter genes, 
would indicate that a lot more of microcystin is being moved out of the cell than the conventional wisdom mm. holds to be the case. Is there environmental as well as laboratory evidence for that? Um, and if so, one, what does that mean for speculating about the why microcystin is producing, yeah. or why microcystin is producing microcystin, and what does that mean for our ability to respond to blooms uh, from a practical drinking water standpoint? Yeah, great question. It's kind of like what the, the, the webinar question was, that if, if, if you have, if you believe in the theory that microcystin is a siderophore, then obviously it has to get pumped out of the cell to scavenge some cation, whether it's iron or, you know, some say it binds calcium better than iron or... Um, so that, that, that's one issue. Um, the other, the other um, point about the transport molecule could be that it, it's doing inter, in, like intracellular transport from where it's produced from this megasynthase complex to where it's needed. So it's trafficking within the cell. Um, yeah, but these are, these are really, these would be really nice experiments to do. And I think, you know, again, in medical research, they do this all the time, you know, Golgi transport trafficking and it, it, it's, it's very doable in our field to actually get to the point. And this is where you will find out what is the ecological basis for production. Why does that organism do it? Again, like John's question, how do you do those experiments in the wild? You know, it's it's, I think it's really hard. Um, and from practical applications, like you said, one thing that, that I say to the water quality managers, so that sort, this, that sort of information is extremely important for water quality managers. To the point, or, or sorry, land managers, land and water managers, because what happened in Australia is that we had a, well, sorry, I didn't, the Australian Aboriginals had a really nice country, and then these, um, as I say in my lectures, pommies, do you use that word in America? No. You call them ex, ex owners of the country or something? Anyway, English. <laughs> in Australia, we call them pommies. Um, but they came in with their English uh, farming practices, and that the, the simple thing for them was if you had trees next to a, a creek or a river, you'd knock those trees down because they get in the way of your cattle or your sheep to, to get to the water and animals have to drink. And this has got major problems in Australia um, because the riparian zone or the trees on the riparian zone, for one, they give you shade. So if you think about when I said the highlight issue, when you get the highlight incidence of cyanobacterial blooms, like this little picture down here, that's, um, that's like a, a we call it billabong or a riverbank. Um, the wind will blow the bloom across and then those cells are then, those, those cells are totally exposed to highlight. And in Australia we do get those highlight, so we get upregulation of the transcription of the toxin, we get upregulation up of transport, so then you've got toxin in the water, which is so much harder to remove than cells. So, because this is the smallest, one of the smallest molecules you see in water supply. Did you tell me? We just got two more questions, one from Greg Boyer and one from Steve Wilhelm from the oh. webinar that I just wanted to get what to they know? before we, uh, <laughs> and, yeah. I'll, I'll let you debate that. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, does that, is that like the practical aspects, I think? Yeah, so again, they're probably going to say um, when, you, when you're using the wrong farm practice for the, oh sorry, yeah, for the wrong type of land, this is the sort of problem you end up with. So the very simple solution now is that from this research, we're planting trees in that riparian zone. Sorry, the other problem was with removing trees, that not, necessar not necessarily related, related to this topic, is that when your cattle move down en masse to a riverbank, instead of having one access point, they all defecate in the water at the same point. So when you've got one point to drink, cattle are not that stupid, right? They'll go in, drink, and defecate on the land. Instead of, if they've got the whole, Mark, you'd know this, you've got cattle. If you've got a river, and every head of animal can move towards that river to drink, they'll just drink and defecate straight there. And this, this in, in loads the nutrients up as well. So this, very simple farming or well, land use practices that have directly direct effects on gene transcription in these toxic species. Well, potentially direct effects. 
Okay, just two, one two quick questions. Uh, one from Greg Boyer, and, and I'll, I'll add on to this too. He said, how typical do you think that 5% toxigenic uh, strains to non-toxigenic, you know, to total population of microcystis is when we see anywhere from 10 to 90 in Lake Erie, and I'll expand on that, we, we see typical numbers around the northeast U.S. of, you know, toxigenic strains that can comprise, you know, around, you know, up to 90% of the population. So do you think that is just an Australian you know, just in that specific reservoir, or how typical do you think yeah, those no, low yeah. abundances? Oh, hi, Greg. How are you doing? Good. Just tie back. Um, no, yeah, that the Warragamba Dam was just a freak, freak thing. The Sydney water supply has never had that problem before, and it, the fact that it only rose to five percent, I guess, was good. Um, but most of the water body, water bodies that we see, you get you get a com complete conversion of a non-toxigenic population. By cell number to a, to to the same cell number of toxigenic, so the water, the nutrients in the water will support a pop, uh, a cell density. The only thing is that the the toxigenicity, say, of microcystis, will completely convert. And these are we've done that. That was the issue in the Murray River as well. So most of the water bodies we've looked at in Australia will have a complete conversion. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. And the last question real quick, and this is from Steve Wilhelm and, uh, and Morgan Steffen is, uh, let's go to it. Hi, Steve. Why have regulators in the promoters if production is constitutive for microcystin? What's he smoking? <laughs> he hasn't done no, anything. No, that's, that's, that's a great question, Steve. I guess you know it's it's like it's just a finesse, a finesse with this regulation. We've always and microcystin, by the way, is is when you talk about it as a secondary metabolite, it's weird in terms of that it's produced constitutively. If you look at all the natural products from say Streptomyces and fungi, they they'll be produced at late growth. So after, then you then you get the gene switched on for secondary metabolism. I, the only thing I can say, Steve, is that probably that it's just finessing the system. It's, 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 it's a finely tuned machine that's been around for you know a couple of billion years, and it probably does have some necessity to, to be regulated because it's so energetically expensive to produce these uh, molecules. We've never really looked at it in terms of, um, uh, say, saxitoxin and cylindrospermopsin. Um, I don't. It, it, like your question, George, there's been a lot of genomics done on these other organisms, but not a lot of the regulatory genetics done on these uh, more alkaloid toxins. Yeah, does Steve know the answer? Has he written we'll that? We'll see what he types. But, uh, <laughs> um, with that, I think we better wrap, up, wrap right. things up, and we can take questions over lunch if people are coming or offline here. I just want to make sure we're not keeping people. So thanks again, Brett. It was a great talk, and it was yeah, great having you here. Yeah, great questions. Thank you.